Hello and welcome to Troubleshooters, the help desk for all your business-related IT conundrums. For the next 15 minutes or so, we'll be trying to answer some of the many questions we get here at .TV from businesses large and small. And here to bring their collective wisdom to bear on today's selection are Bill Boyle, IT journalist and editor of trade magazine PC Dealer. Good evening, Bill. Hi, Peter. And joining him, Francis West, whose company FW Systems specializes in networks and systems design. Good evening, Francis. Good evening. Okay, our first question today comes from David Strang in Leeds, who's uh, having problems realizing the promise of video conferencing. David writes to us, I'd like to set up a video conferencing link with a reseller I deal with a lot in Canada. I have the camera and a 56K modem, but I only get a few frames a second. Is ISDN my only option? Bill, what do you think about this? It's not the only option, but I would say it's probably the smart option for the moment. Smart because it'll deliver a speed of approximately 30 frames per second, um, probably at the top end of ISDN. He's, in the right, he's going in the right direction because he's got the right equipment. Um, you can also, I think he's probably just missed the special BT offers. They had a cheap £99 deal on uh, setting up an ISDN line. Um, don't worry, that'll probably come around again. Maybe probably an even cheaper form. Um, and that will give him the ability to go just to the top end of what ISDN is available. There are other options, least line and internet protocol. I'd say internet protocol is probably one to avoid at the moment because the, it's, it's a bit of a like most of the internet, a bit of a dodgy medium at the moment. You don't know when your connection will drop or um, you'll suddenly find yourself not to video conferencing, video conferencing with anyone. Right. I mean, is there any, any kind of time horizon for, 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 for safe use of IP in this kind of situation? Is it going to come soon? Uh, well, um, Coca-Cola have just gone for an IP internal network, but I think the fact that they're going for an internal network and not speaking to the rest of the world via IP shows that there are some glitches there and it's not business critical at the moment. It's not an application that you would be able to say, I'm going to have this very important video conference with some very, very important uh, clients somewhere in South America and I have to have that conference at this particular time, not at the moment. I'd write it off for that. Francis, how do you, how do you feel about this? Do you, do you, I think you're a fan of uh, getting a lease line. Lease here. lines, yeah. I mean, I was just thinking about the question now. If he's doing so much business with this uh, supplier of his, maybe he should... Um, ask them to pay a bit more or share the cost of a lease line because surely both parties are going to benefit and then you'll definitely get a much better, much better uh, picture than you will, will even get with ISDN. So that's what I would recommend. Okay, all right. Our next question comes from Graham Sumer via email. And Graham, t Graham asks us, he says that there seem to be so many different versions of Unix and he's wondering uh, if we can shed some light on the language. Uh, his company may decide to use Unix in the future for building an intranet system, and if they go ahead with it, he's going to be in charge of recruiting staff to fill some of the new vacancies. Now, Graham wants to know if a person trained in one type of Unix will be able to, to, to code using a different type of Unix, such as Linux. Is it difficult for staff to migrate between Unix flavors? Francis, this is a complex area. Uh, uh, tell yes, us what I you think know. so, because, um, first of all, Unix IT people are normally very expensive. So... If the company, whoever he's working for, is looking in the future to migrate to another form of Unix, he should obviously make sure that the person he's employing is going to be able to go ahead with this migration, or otherwise he should also find out maybe what, what the uh, cost of training is going to be involved before he carries on. So you're suggesting some practical tests here to, to see if these yeah. people can actually handle, handle the language. Exactly. Surely if they're thinking of this, they can have their current suppliers set up a scenario at their office and then bring the people in, in for interviews and then have them solve the problem. Okay. Bill, how, how difficult is it in terms of navigating the, the different flavors of Unix and, and, and transferring from one to the other? Um, I think the, the, you know, the point is that uh, with, I don't know, 20, 30 different flavors of Unix, you will get a recruitment question as well as a technological question because you will get to, uh, maybe 100 applic applicants who will say, I can, I can do Unix, I can do all these different flavors of Unix. The difficulty for a business is that um, they may have 80% of the knowledge, so they may have 80% of the skill sets in most of the, the, the flavors of Unix. Linux is now a very particular, a very popular flavor of Unix, very, very, very good. Um, everyone's answer to NT at the moment. However, you may find that the person that you employ only knows 80% of that. Now, 80% sounds a lot, but when 20% of your business runs on that critical application of that 20%, and they don't know it, then you've made uh, a big business mistake. So the advice here really is be careful, be very, very careful. Very, very okay. careful. Moving on, uh, next question comes from uh, Graham Fairchild in Barnstable. 
Uh, with hardware technology advancing so quickly, asks Graham, I think leasing computers may well be a more cost-effective option than buying new ones every 18 months. Does the panel agree? Now, I think there are different views here. Bill, uh, how, do you, how are you fixed with leasing? Leasing is a very expensive option unless um, you change your machines on the dot every 12 months or every 18 months. And the fact is, most medium-sized businesses do not need to change their machines that often. Um, you'll find that most leasing agreements that actually offer you value for money, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, needs, you've got to sign up for three years. So you have a three-year, uh, it's, it's like three-year shackles, not a window of opportunity to change. Those are three-year three shackles you have on which uh, you've got that machinery. And if, uh, knowing this business, things change and you have to buy a complete new multimedia outfit, for example, for a whole section of your business, you're stuck with uh, old technology. And you will find that if you then want to move on, uh, to, to, with the leasing, leasing company, there will be penalty clause after penalty clause. Therefore, do you really need to, the questions are, do you really need to upgrade in that, uh, that time frame? And there are, there are other, other options. Okay. So really, it's for serial upgraders. Leasing Absolutely. works rather well. And, and probably for big organizations in that context. Multinationals, too. corporates, um, or for those organizations that really have to be at the, the leading edge of technology. And let's face it, there aren't that many of us that need to do that. Okay, Francis, you're something of a skeptic on leasing. Yes, no, no, I personally think uh, leased or leasing is purely for cash flow purposes. Mm. I mean, for a company that, that really needs cash flow, leasing yeah. is maybe, maybe the better option. But if we look at today's machines, that even the, the machines with P2 motherboards, they can upgrade, say the company is buying them at a 233, they upgrade to, to a 333 chip is fine. And now with the new BX motherboards, B for both the X or the Corsa, they can actually um, start at um, the, a higher 233 and go up to 450. So, I mean, who needs more speed than that? Unless, of course, give it another uh, six months and the programmers who have written programs, they will need it. But um, most unlikely. Shouldn't, sm shouldn't small organizations be worried about being left behind on this upgrade treadmill as well? Again, you see, um, I deal with so many different companies, and 90% uh, of companies unless they are uh, you know, publication people, they are normally using a bit of accounts and a bit of spreadsheet and, and, and word processing. And a normal Pentium 200 MMX is more than sufficient. It's, it's when they start playing with, with uh, video conferencing and that, then maybe they should rather look at other areas like their network, rather spend their money in, in networks and get their bandwidth bigger than upgrading their PCs. Okay, okay. Cautious message there then on, on, on leasing. Our next question really returns to the internet. Uh, it's from uh, Bettina Moreau in Shepherd's Bush. I'm a sales rep for a Brazilian documentary company, says Bettina. I work from home and spend a lot of money calling the head office in Rio. I've got internet access and a 56K modem, and I wondered if I can use this connection to make cheap international calls. What do you think, Francis? Personal, yes. Business, no. The uh, reason for it, that is... Um, Yes, I mean, you can make calls now, say, using either web phone. There are some new actual telephones out which you can use to uh, dial the other side. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's pretty new technology. So it does work. It's great fun. I use it all the time. But for business, I, I'm very skeptical, very skeptical, because it's a lot of time that you're going to try and get a connection, and the other side has to be ready as well at the same time, waiting for you. So there's a lot of waiting factors on both sides. And if the connection is not there, or if it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and all the Americans are woken up, forget it. You're going you're gonna to struggle. But, but looking ahead, uh, definitely, voice over yes. IP is a, is a major threat to the established telecoms organizations. Oh, yes, uh, yes, I'm using big it myself. The jungle, BT and Deutsche Telekom and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, what, again, you know, the, the key issue here for the, for, for the Internet is what kind of time frame are we looking at before voice over IP starts to become a threat for these guys? I think it is already. It definitely is already, you know, because um, even just my immediate family in South Africa, I've supplied them with the video camera, so I'm speaking to them over weekends or evening times, and it's costing me an 0845 local call. Whereas, um, you know, for business, again, I wouldn't advise it, but for private use is brilliant. Okay. Is exactly. that because of the unreliability of it or the dropout, you know, the fact that your call can suddenly stop in the middle or yeah, that or as well, but slow response rates? So again, the main reasons. Um, what I would say on that, on that subject is also you should really look at your internet providers okay. because a lot of people go with um, you know, uh, well-known people such as BT, Virgin, AOL, and say CompuServe. But your problem with that is that um, 
there's a lot of people that belong to them and of course everybody is trying this I would suggest rather try and find other companies other internet providers that less people are using because again your bandwidth is going to be much greater so the less people know about your internet provider the better a, I agree with that, but there's, no, there's also a problem with that. You're, you're, an ISP is not contractually obliged to make sure when you pick that phone up, and I've, I've tried the web phones. I love gadgets. They're great machines. They're really good. Um, I wouldn't bet the business on it, but you, you can pick up the phone. Your ISP is not guaranteed to make that connection and have that connection go through the whole of, the, of your call. If it drops out, then there's nothing. There's, you just, you know, you've got no comeback on a business deal. Um, whereas your telecom provider has got is contractually obliged to make sure nine times out of ten that the call goes through and you have that, yeah. Okay. Guarantee. So, so nice to play with, but it's not not really a business yeah. tool. Yet. Not the moment. Okay. Moving on to just just to our final question here from Blay Whitehouse in Tunbridge Wells. I make and sell my own greeting cards from home, says Blay. Uh, I'd like to scan some samples into a website run by the local library but I'm worried about the copyright, copyright uh, questions uh, that exist on the internet. What are my rights, Bill? I'd be more worried about the copyright <laughs> problems at your local library than the local internet. Um, presumably what um, uh, you know, the writer is doing is actually pr putting the, uh, the card on the, the, the li library's website. Um, uh, they have absolutely no difference in copyright law on the internet than in, in, uh, in ordinary day-to-day -day copyright. So therefore you can uh, what you're doing is you're exposing yourself to a lot more risk because there are a lot more, there's a lot more traffic on the internet. Um, well, some parts of the internet that are most, more traffic in your local library, well, that sometimes can be arguable. Um, so there's absolutely not. What you have to be careful of, and, and if, you, if you look at the arguments that have taken place already, the Oasis argument, for example, Oasis sued an individual website um, which was reproducing lyrics from their songs, uh, and that was a copyright issue because that's illegal. Um, but how do you find out whether someone has nicked your idea? You could be on holiday somewhere and find your, your card uh, ripped off. How do you find out where that person is? Um, or where you, you know, are you going to take them to court? It's, uh, it's a jungle that hasn't yet percolated down to the individual who's got a problem. But um, I'm sure we'll see it soon. Well, moving on from the local library a little bit, Francis. I mean, you know, the, the question of intellectual property mm -hmm. and the internet is 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 is, is a, a, a substantial difficulty for large organisations, content providers like Disney and so on and so forth. There are a lot of worries there, aren't there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's just I, I think it's just impossible for them to control. You know, I think if they had to police it, they would probably spend more money policing it than they are losing in in possible revenue. And so it's somewhere you've got to draw the line as to which one do you have to follow. I think we, we're lucky we're in the early stages of it, so at the moment the loss is probably not that great. But in future, yes, we will see significant losses. Okay. But at the moment, um, you can't do anything about it. Thank you, Francis. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Uh, thanks to everybody who wrote in. And don't forget, if you've got a problem with IT in your business, or well, would just like a second opinion on something, we're here, uh, we're here to help. On behalf of our correspondents, I'd like to thank uh, my guests for being with us. Thank you to Bill and, uh, and Francis also. Mm -hmm. And thank you for tuning in. I'm Peter Kerwin. This has been Troubleshooters. Until next week, goodbye. <laughs>